is tonight uh, about switching providers. Uh, we've got CenturyLink, we're in Duranes. I don't know if anyone has uh, some suggestions for us, but it's it's been a real problem. So I'm on my cell phone, uh, which is an iPhone mini. So all of you are really small on my screen, unfortunately. Um, uh, great session, uh, very tense session, very difficult session, very fast and furious 30 days as you described, Robert. Um, it was a session that I think was unprecedented for a couple of reasons. Number one, the, um, the, the amount of revenue that is coming into the state is astronomical. And so there are, there are these competing interests between the folks who would rather... Oops. 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 I look like we lost him. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> I'm like... We're on the call. Uh, I think I'm going to turn my video off. Is that cool with you guys? Yes. Okay, cool. I'm going to turn it off, and so that way I can I can get my points across. Apologies for that. Uh, plus, I didn't dress up. There we go. Uh, so... Uh, uh, excess revenues, we have competing over, you know, putting the money away under the mattress or making historic investments in a wide array of things. Um, I have to tell you, making these historic investments, I think, is, is what we should do, obviously, but it's also difficult because many times agencies are just not equipped to make these transformations, if you will. Uh, right off the bat, case in point, the education system. Uh, you know, so many of us would love to put more money in, but if you talk to rank and file, you know, school districts across the state, ours included, sometimes it's difficult for that money to get to the kid and their family and money gets stashed away in one of the mattresses, either at the district level, school level, et cetera. So it's it's not as easy as it sounds. It's, it's very complicated, I think, to make transformational investments. Having said that, I think we did continue on that path of increasing our budget. This is a 14% budget increase from the previous year, and it is by far the largest state budget that we've ever passed. Uh, some of the things that are included in that budget uh, is the clearing of the DD waiver, which for far too long, there's been a growing list of services for uh, children and families that, I mean, some, some, sadly, some young people never got access to services because that waiting list was so long. We finally have enough money to clear it. On the, on the back end, the problem is that we don't have enough providers to provide the services. It's a very, very real issue. Uh, but that's definitely one of the highlights of the budget. Uh, it's an $8.6 billion budget, uh, which uh, invests in an array of ways in things like early childhood, public education, uh, pretty big investments in Native American um, education uh, uh, strategies, uh, primarily the work of the representative Derek Lente, which as you, some of you know, he's been working on these issues for a long time. And we finally put money behind the policies that he's been working on for such a long time. In addition to that, I think that the legislature um, really, I think, uh, threaded a needle of supporting working families. And, and there are a number of ways in which that is done, including the state budget, but also in House Bill 163, which is our omnibus tax package. Uh, that tax package, which I'm very proud to have been able to play a role in creating and drafting, um, includes uh, money for a state level child tax credit. Uh, as you know, the federal child tax credit ended in December. It was not renewed by Congress. Uh, New Mexico passed its own, and now we're only one of seven states with a state-level children tax credit, with child tax credit, which now, in conjunction with the historic work we did the last two years on the working families tax credit, creates, through the tax code, a refundable, literally cold, hard cash type of credit that working families with children can access in order to offset the cost of things like child care, health care, education, rent, et cetera. There's a lot of movement out there in, in other parts of the country around a universal or guaranteed basic income. I think New Mexico through our tax code is moving in that direction. And it is something that I'm very proud of because it is something that I have been talking about for a long, long time at these meetings, um, even long before I was a legislator when I was a, a vice chair of Water Living A under Rock and Allen many years ago. So I'm very proud of the work that's happened. I was joking with some of my colleagues um, at the end of the session. It used to be that there were movidas made in the tax bill to support a corporation or to support some sort of out of state interest. Uh, the work that happens in the middle of the night now in the legislature on the tax bill is to get a child tax credit, you know, is to get something for working people. 
Um, and that to me is something that I'm very, very proud of because it's completely changed, I think, the face of, of, uh, of the tax code here in New Mexico. Um, also included in, in the tax bill is, and, and these are things that I'm not right now, but these are things that were negotiated and things that ultimately I think will be helpful to people. Um, and that includes a reduction in the gross receipts tax of, uh, it's a quarter uh, of 1% uh, over two years. We did negotiate a trigger. If state revenues go down under a certain level, it'll go back to what it is now. Uh, gross receipts taxes are grossly inequitable and regressive because they hit lower income people harder, hardest. Uh, but we also have a, and we also have a very high rate. Uh, and that's because we decided many years ago, not we, I wasn't in there, but the legislature decided to uh, eliminate the tax on food. So, uh, you know, when I went to Costco yesterday and literally bought $575 worth of groceries, I did not pay a penny in tax. Uh, I feel like I should have paid some tax on that. Um, uh, the lady next to me buying a pair of shoes for her kid had to pay eight and a half percent tax on that. So, you know, it's 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 something that's difficult and 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 certainly a tough conversation that we need to have eventually on gross receipts taxes, but it is a conversation that needs to be had, and I hope that we have it here in the next session. Uh, or two. Um, in addition to that, we also um, eliminated uh, or exempted Social Security benefits from uh, income tax, uh, but this is another place where we negotiated an income level. Um, it is $150,000 for married individuals or joint fathers or $100,000. Way too high. I don't know anyone who makes that much on Social Security income, uh, especially in New Mexico. Uh, but this is one of those things that you know the governor announced right before the state of the state. We had no idea she was going to make that announcement. Um, and I heard from many, many of, of our neighbors, uh, not you all, because I think you all understand the tax code better than most because you're super active. But I did hear from a lot of folks in our community, in our district that were saying, hey, wait a minute, you're taxing my Social Security income. We're not. Uh, uh, up until this year, we were only, uh, you're exempted if you make less than $25,000, which I would argue is probably like 85% of beneficiaries in New Mexico. Um, but needless to say, that's something that happened um, in that tax bill. Uh, we also did a couple of other things, including making the solar tax credit refundable and transferable. This is huge because as we talk about rooftop solar for too long, it's been something for our upper middle class and upper class households. To be able to front that type of money, to be able to get the loan, to get the system on your roof has been inaccessible to many. Now you can take that credit and literally the solar company will take it and off that take the price off of the solar panels um, in the initial cost to you as a consumer. And it's also refundable, meaning you don't have to owe money to the state in order to get the credit. Now you can actually be, um, you know, uh, uh, you can be a taxpayer that doesn't owe the state anything. And that credit will be refunded to you in the form of a payment. Uh, huge, huge deal in terms of rooftop solar here in New Mexico. Uh, lastly, uh, we finally exempted feminine hygiene products from gross receipts tax. Um, uh, you know, as, as my colleague, San Cristian Trujillo, uh, stated, um, you know, uh, many times she's been the champion of this bill for many, many years. You know, we don't, we, we treat um, other things as medicine or, or, or not, or, or, you know, she says, uh, we don't tax, you know, Viagra, but we tax, you know, feminine hygiene products. And, and that to me just, you know, obviously doesn't make sense. So we finally got rid of that tax, um, those particular products. Um, in terms of economic justice, um, we did some very important work around housing. We established a New Mexico Housing Trust Fund, which will, re which will receive $25 million a year in perpetuity. And that'll only grow because it is a percentage of the severance tax permanent fund value. Uh, that money will go through the Mortgage Finance Authority and we will be able to invest in housing stock from single family homes to uh, to uh, multifamily housing complexes across the state. As you know, we have a huge housing crunch in our district is particularly uh, evident. Uh, gentrification is all over us. Uh, some of you mentioned Sawmill District and, and Sawmill and whatnot, great assets to our community, but it is also something we've gotta be cognizant of because it will push poor people out. Um, that housing trust fund uh, will be a part of that, um, of that lifelong work, I think for the rest of our lives, in this community, downtown Albuquerque, we will be fighting against gentrification in every which way uh, that we can without being unreasonable. Obviously, I love the sawmill market. It's great. 
uh, that, you know, we can buy, can walk and take our family to these great local shops. But there is another side to that story and that is gentrification. So we've got to be able to balance both of those. Um, in addition, we passed House Bill 132. Please give yourself a big round of applause. 36% on predatory loans. 36% on predatory loans. Finally, uh, Ona Porter, who is a neighbor of ours, has been working on this for years. Karen Myers, uh, Roxanne Allen, Terry Storch. So many of you have been working long before I got involved in politics on capping those interest rates, and it finally got done this year. Um, but the work oh, yeah. doesn't stop there. Yeah. Uh, you're, you're like way past time. <laughs> Sorry about that, y'all. Um... Javier, if there's anything else we can like, if there, any, I know we had some questions in the chat, but I also wanted to make some uh, some time for Senator Ortiz Pino, if possible. Gotcha, uh, gotcha. I'm sorry, I'm I'm, I'm over time. Uh, yeah, if you guys give me ten more seconds, uh, I will wrap up. Uh, healthcare, we did a lot of good stuff. Uh, things that didn't happen: Voting Rights Act. Uh, there was a huge push on the House side to fix the Voting Rights Bill that passed the Senate to include really, really important provisions. It died on the Senate floor because of a filibuster. Um, Hydrogen didn't happen, and I want to explain hydrogen very quickly because a lot of you were opposed to it. Uh, to me, it was about creating some sort of framework because hydrogen is not illegal. Do not, and, and as you saw now, the city of Albuquerque is starting a huge hydrogen hub at the Sunport, and that is without any state oversight at this point. Uh, that's That was a big driver for me to support and try to push that bill forward. Uh, it died. Uh, at this point, we're going to have to work from behind now because hydrogen is here. Uh, it's in Albuquerque. It's going to be in other places. And we're going to have to keep our eyes and ears open next session to make sure that we are regulating the heck out of those folks. Um, and then lastly, the junior bill, uh, which might take us into a special or extraordinary session over the next couple of weeks. More to come on that. But that bill would have funded a whole lot of projects across the state. For myself, I funded a lot of stuff in our district. And I also funded an endowment for a social worker student scholarship at New Mexico Highlands University, which I was very excited about. Uh, all of that was vetoed we might bring the legislature back in a couple of weeks to restore all that funding. I'll stop there. Apologies for taking too long. Uh, would love to hear uh, any questions and answer any questions. Nice, Javier. I'm gonna, I know there are some questions in the chat. Um, I, I, welcome, I welcome you to use the chat. I know you're on your phone too, but I also just wanna make sure that we gave some time for Senator Ortiz Pino. Um, uh, Jerry, if you're there, I, I appreciate your patience. Uh, the question I asked Javier in the beginning was, um, what were you, what did you feel were some of the successes, uh, for yourself in terms of some of the legislation you were trying to pass? And then obviously, uh, thinking about like what didn't pass, what are some things you'd like hope for, uh, for the next session, uh, for 2023? As usual, the, um, the work of one that doesn't get done at one session, we begin immediately working on it for the next session. It's an ongoing process, continuous. It's a continuous process of, of uh, taking your defeats, modifying what you proposed, and trying again. Um, I think, to me, um, the, the, the one thing that I that I passed that reached the governor that I uh, sponsored that reached the passed and reached the governor's desk was the uh, elimination of the sunset clause on the um, on the tax the, the health what we call the health care quality surcharge, which is a tax that the nursing homes and the assisted living facilities voluntarily agreed to, and they pay that tax. We match it with Medicaid, and if they've met quality standards, we, we increase their reimbursement. It's made a huge difference in the life of people who live uh, in, in a nursing home or an assisted living facility, because these programs are able to hire enough staff, they can have enough uh, uh, support staff to really to improve the quality of the care that they provide. And that, that had a sunset clause when we put it on three years ago. It was due to expire this year by getting rid of it. And, and the governor did sign that. Uh, to me, that was, that was a nice step forward. I think um, Representative Martinez uh, pretty much covered you know, most of, of what I was gonna bring up. Um, I would uh, add a couple of things. Um, let me talk a little bit about the crime package because that, that turned out to be something that was a, a, a serious matter of contention between the governor's office and the, and the, and the Senate. Uh, I'm not, uh, I think a couple of pieces were also uh, bones of contention between her and the House, but for the most part, she's blaming the Senate that she didn't get what she wanted. And what she wanted basically was uh, to be able to detain people who've been arrested before they go to trial 
to detain them and have them prove that they really are innocent and could be let out before uh, you know re reversing what the Constitution says. Uh, it was a no. It was a no-brainer in the Senate. Uh, and, and I think in the House, too, that, did, that never even came across. But she kept pressuring, pressuring, trying to get us to add it back in. I was very upset with it. She also took out, when we passed the crime package, she took out something that we're all scratching our heads over. It was a requirement that the state create a, um, a registry of bad cops, cops who've been disciplined, been fired, been sued for and, and successfully sued for unnecessary use of force and so on. Uh, we wanted to have that available so that a cop who got fired in Rio Rancho didn't get hired in Santa Fe or one that got fired in Santa Rosa didn't get picked up in Moriarty. It, 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 it just seemed like a simple thing. She vetoed that out of the crime package, uh, gave no particular explanation for that. She also um, uh, restricted to, to some extent, our efforts at police retention and training, um, that was something that, that we thought made a lot of sense uh, to be able to put extra money into a pot that could be used to provide bonuses for uh, law enforcement officers who uh, want to stay on the job for another year beyond their retirement, uh, things like that. Um, we, we need to have a, a frank discussion with the governor about you know, why some of these things got knocked out. Um, we did, the other thing she vetoed, and I think it, it, it will have an impact on crime, is the raises for judges. You know, we, 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 we have in this state a situation where many times her request for nominations for a vacant district court position produce one or sometimes two names. Nobody else is interested in the job because the salaries are so low compared with what any lawyer in private practice is earning that we can't really attract very good judges. This has a definite impact on the crime situation because you have judges who are not very experienced trying to deal with these incredibly difficult cases. We thought we needed to increase those, those salaries significantly. She said in her veto message, well, they're already getting a 7% raise that all the state employees are getting. That's not gonna make a difference. For, she's still gonna get one nomination in many of these positions. So um, it's interesting, <laughs> Representative Martinez explained why some of their bills didn't get through the, the Senate. Uh, we had many, many, never even got a hearing in the House. And so I think there was some tension between the two houses. That was brought about by the fact that the House allows their members to debate every single motion for three hours. That's their ground rule, which kept them up all night, many nights. We don't have that, 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 we didn't have that problem in the Senate. Um, when he said we had a filibuster on the last morning, yeah, we did because we didn't get the bill till 1030 on the last morning. And that gave us an hour and a half. Well, anybody can talk for an hour and a half and S Senator Scherer certainly could outdo that, which he probably did. And we never got to, to, to vote on, on, on the election reform bill as a result. Uh, but the, for example, the clean fuels bill uh, Senator Stewart was furious because after working so hard on the clean fuels bill, which would have increased the standards, never even got heard on the House floor. Never heard, never got heard. Um, so we're, a lot of work remains to be done, but we did accomplish a great deal. And I just want to end with a, with a little comment about the future. Um, we, we, plant, we, we planted a lot of seeds in the state. We have free essentially free college tuition, free college. Um, there's still fees and books and so on, but essentially there's no tuition charges for, for, for New Mexico high school graduates who want to go to school in this state. That is going to have great impact in the future. Our early childhood program is going to have great impact in the future. The improvements in education we made are going to have great impact in the future. A lot of these seeds have been planted, but we have to keep nourishing them. We can't consider those to be finished products. And one of the things that happened, of course, is we, we were patting ourselves in the back because we spent 8.5 billion, 14% increase, nothing to sneeze at, but we still have 30% reserves, even after we had the tax rebates going back to people um, this year as part of the tax package. So we're giving back some money, we cut taxes, we, and we still have 30% reserves. That is based on oil selling for $65 a barrel, and it's selling for almost twice that right now which means that next year, 
the reserves are going to be in the neighborhood of unless you know uh, unless peace were to break out in Ukraine and suddenly the oil prices plummet, that is not probably going to happen for a while, if ever, uh, in the next year. So I think we're going to look at, at, at a similar bonanza of money that we need to make some sound investments with. And uh, we started that process. I think one of the, my fears is that the fact that we now have uh, an early childhood fund that's $2 billion plus dollars is going to be used as an argument against passing the constitutional amendment this fall. We can't let that happen. We have to pass that amendment. So I'll stand for questions. There's a lot of other things we could go into. It was an intense session because you can't do this much in 30 days and do it well. I would, I'll just be honest with you, particularly when we don't really spend 30 days on it. The first week is a watch. We don't get started until the second week. They're printing the bills, they're assigning numbers. All of that could be done ahead of time. I, 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 for the life of me, I don't understand why we waste a full one fifth of the whole legislative session when we only have 30 days to do it. But we do and we always have, and it's hard to break the culture down. And, and um, uh, so hopefully in the 60 day session, a lot of these issues will be taken care of. Thanks. Thank you, Senator. And just more proof that uh, perhaps uh, pay legislature and also building capacity for the, the legislative office so that people can do exactly what you just said, which is, you know, building out building out capacity for governance. And I'm all for that. I, I know there are a ton of questions in the chat. So I, I'll to Javier and to Jerry. Um, I know there are, there, there are a ton of, I know I, you're probably scanning some of these. I'm just going to go up and down the chat to see if I can catch some, but I know this one is for you, Senator. Uh, this is from Felice. What happened to the 10% of cannabis tax for treatment? It, it died. It, it didn't get heard. Uh, we, we, we passed it out of the Senate. It died in the house. I, I don't know exactly why it died. Uh, it had a it had an increase in the um, um, uh, micro enterprise uh, cap on how many plants you could have in a micro enterprise that died along with it. So there was a lot of. I, I can I can I can tell you why Senator died, Senator. Yeah. It's because water protections were stripped out in the Senate, um, and that was a yeah, top right, right, right. State. Unnecessary top, water protections. Oh, the water oh, protections oh. weren't necessary. That was that was stripped out because nobody convinced us that they were necessary. Okay, well, we'll beg to differ. Yeah. Uh, the, so as a uh, result, so as a result the micro enterprises are going to have a real hard time surviving in a world in which Duke Rodriguez can grow 100,000 plants in a year and they can grow 100. Okay, so let me, let me, uh, let, let me jump in there now that you're finished, Senator. Uh, water protections, which were very important to our Aseca communities, were stripped out and they were up in arms. And we did not have enough time to fix something that really should have never happened on the Senate side. And therefore, that bill died. Um, clean fuel, clean fuel standards did get a hearing. It died on the floor on a tide vote. Um, I can't tell you why, but that's democracy. It died on a 33-33 vote. Um, and Voting Rights Act passed very late in the House because the Senate sat on it. And I know Eric Shimamoto is here, and he knows the background story of Senate Rules Committee and how long they sat on Senate Bill 8 and essentially led it to its death. So that's why the House stood up for the rights of water protectors across the state stood up for voting rights of people across the state because my uh, friends in the other chamber were, uh, and not you, you're great, but some of your other friends in the Senate um, were playing games. So we'll leave it at that. Thank you. You both for that. And yeah, I have a question from Roxanne. Will the housing trust fund be used in part to keep people from being moved out because of gentrification? Um, the housing trust fund is for housing stock, um, you know, and so I don't know to what extent it could be used for services to help transition people, uh, but that's something certainly worth looking into. It goes for three things, new construction, renovations of existing home homes, and it can be used for weatherization. Hmm. That's helpful. Thank you. Um, this one's from Marianne Dixon, and this is directed to you, Javier. Uh, can you tell us why you thought the Blue Hydrogen Hub was a good infrastructure investment, given the climate damage it contributes to? Uh, because uh, hydrogen is here, and hydrogen is happening under our very noses, and that would have created at least some semblance of a framework. Um, I, by no means, will 
say that it's the perfect framework. I think we'll hear from Bettina later, who I have a lot of respect for in the work that the Environmental Law Center does. Uh, but it was a framework, and there was no other framework that was presented by anyone. Uh, my that hydrogen industries start right now, which they are, because they just cut a deal with Universal Hydrogen at the Sunport, um, and it is harder to regulate things after the fact. Um, so that's why I thought it would have been a good idea. Um, again, not the perfect idea, but a good idea. Thank you. Um... Oh, this one is from Francis Ortega, and this is for you, Jerry. Uh, how did School of Public Health do? Well, we got started, at least. You know, in the special session, we had asked for 70 million, uh, uh, 20 million to hire faculty and start the curriculum work at both campuses. It's a dual campus program, New Mexico State and UNM. And then 50 million for a building at UNM because they, they, they're strapped for suitable space there. And we didn't get the building, but we did get the, and we didn't even get 20 million. We got 15 million, I think five to New Mexico State and 10 to UNM to get started. So it's alive and well, we will pursue the building through capital outlay in the next year. We were late in the process. And so it makes it very difficult to get stuff done when the LFC had already made a lot of their recommendations by the time we came up with this idea. Thanks, Senator. I realize it's 3.41 and I'm going to shift our agenda just a little bit just to give some time to Virginia. I know um, I just want to just give a big, uh, big thank you to both you, Senator Jerry Ortiz Pino, and, and, and to you, Representative Martinez, uh, for your time, for all of your hard work, especially. I know I know a 30-day 30 30 session is not easy by any stretch of the imagination. And, and I appreciate that you would answer our questions too, no matter how contentious they can be. <laughs> um, and I know we all have your contact information. You're welcome to share that in the chat as well. Um, I know we all have like cell phones and emails and stuff, but you are welcome to share that here. Um, and if anyone has any questions, please feel, feel please feel free to contact Jerry and Javier uh, when you can at, at your at, at your convenience. But uh, please uh, know that we are grateful for bo for both of your time today. Uh, and then I will pass it to you, Bob, to introduce Virginia, if you will. Okay, our next speaker is Virginia Nekochea. I hope I got that right, or almost right. Uh, she's with the New Mexico Environmental Law Center, and she's going to give, I hopefully give us her view of what happened in the 30-day uh, session and what, you know, what, what we're disappointed about. Go ahead. Uh, yes, let me, let me just... Um put on and I, I will be quick. Give me, how much time do I have? Uh, on the agenda, you have 10 minutes. Okay, so I will try to pack it into 10, mi 10 minutes action packed. <laughs> um, and, and good afternoon, buenas tardes everyone. Um, I'm uh, Virginia Necochea and I'm the executive director at the New Mexico Environmental Law Center. And before I, I just go through this pretty quick, I just want to recognize that yesterday was the Mexica New Year. Not everyone has their New Year um, during the Gregorian time. And I just want to recognize my own Mexican indigenous family and roots. And we are officially in um, Ten Tochtli, which is a, a year of the rabbit. So I just wanted to mention that. Um, and so, like I said, I'm the current director at the Law Center, the first woman of color in its 35 year history to lead the organization. So very proud of that. It took many changes and shifts for that to happen. Um, I'm a longtime educator, former, former faculty member, community advocate, and I wear my organizer hat very proudly. And so with that, I am gonna shift a bit when I, as I enter and talk about the legislative session from the perspective of um, an organizer, someone who works for an environmental justice law center, and someone who actually grew up in a frontline community. And so a, a major part of my work is focused on really understanding and disrupting structural inequities that exist in our society, including um, the education system and the legal system and the legislative system, which I'll talk about some of the challenges that it poses um, a bit later. And I also want to make sure that I, that I say up front that everything that I share with you today, I do that with humility and respect for everyone. Come on. 
sorry, I, I yeah, um, someone unmuted. But anyway, so I um, just really want to recognize that as we enter these spaces, we have multiple intersections and that is the case for me. So as a woman of color, a Chicana, immersed in the environmental world and coming from a frontline um, community. And yeah, as I said, the New Mexico Environmental Law Center, we have this really long trajectory of serving our clients and communities across the state of New Mexico. For those of you who don't know um, much about the Law Center, we proudly represent uh, many, like hundreds of clients, nonprofit organizations, coalitions, and associations, and their fight to demand their fundamental human rights to clean air, land, and water. And so we, we represent um, uh, clients in fighting against uranium contamination, extractive industries, um, air pollution, and so many other major issues that are happening across the state. And the work at the Law Center really falls into three large areas. So our legal services that the majority are free, pro bono legal services that we provide to clients, I'm very proud of that fact. Uh, and our policy work, which encompasses not just the legislative session, but also work that we do um, at you know uh, city level, county level, and then another major area is our advocacy, education, and outreach work that we do as well as we support clients and communities because we realize that legal services and policy are tools in the toolbox, but they are not the one and only solution to the issues our, our communities are facing. And so, you know, it's very important for people to understand that as, you know, I'm, I'm talking to you here that we center our work on environmental justice. And for us, that actually means that we are centering the people and the clients who are most impacted by environmental harms and degradation. And so it's really important for us to name environmental racism and to recognize that that legacy continues across our entire state and that you know we really need to be honest in the in the recognition and acknowledgement that race and class but more so race is the greatest predictor of how much environmental pollution one will be exposed to in their lifetime and so you know with that i just want to echo um, that the legislative session posed many challenges and a 30 day session is very intense, much respect to our legislators for all of their work. And in the same way, it poses a lot of challenges to the environmental organizations and organizations across the board who are working with communities to enact change. And so with that, it was very hard for the environmental world. There were some wins, many disappointments, and many learning lessons for us. And I just want to recognize two wins that I'm sure some of you have heard of, if not most. So House Bill 37, seed bill, um, did pass and was signed into law. And that would, you know, created that state grant program supporting the, and improving the energy efficiency of low income households, which is very important if we're talking about equity. For us personally at the Law Center, the Uranium Mine Cleanup and Reclamation Bill very important for us to support because you know our clients um, were part of this these advocacy efforts and much of the work um, for the law center does focus on uranium cleanup and the fight against uranium and so this bill establishes a state coordination process to address unreclaimed uranium mines that continue to expose many, especially indigenous tribal communities to toxic and radioactive pollution. And so we're just really happy that we did have some wins during this short session. There were many disappointments for us and Green Amendment was one of them. And Green Amendment did not make it through. This was the second year that it was introduced into the session. We did get a further, a further along with um, the Green Amendment this year. And for those of you, um, you know, who were keeping track, 
it, it's basically what the green, the power of the Green Amendment is that it amends the New Mexico Constitution in a way that it elevates environmental rights in the same to the same level as other civil rights that we're familiar with, such as freedom of speech, due process, freedom of religion. And for us at the Law Center, we feel very strongly that you know everyone across our state. Um, should, you know, it deserves our fundamental human right to clean air, land and water. And this would have elevated those environmental rights for especially the clients and communities who are bearing the brunt of environmental hazards. So we're still in conversation if we're going to, um, you know, work on this next year. It was a priority at the Law Center. Um, and just, you know, one thing I, I want to point out is that if it would have passed, it would have gone to the statewide ballot for the people to vote. And that's what we're asking um, our legislators to do is allow the people of New Mexico to vote on this. Another disappointment for us at the Law Center was our environmental civil penalties. And that would have adjusted um, civil penalties for violations of the environment that need to be adjusted for inflation. It would have amended so many of the different environmental acts um, for civil penalties, it was introduced, it went nowhere. So similar to what the legislators spoke of, you know, it just didn't gain any traction at all. Um, but, you know, I, I want to shift here to, you know, amidst these disappointments, there were major lessons learned. And I share them with you, you know, from, again, the frame of thinking about the need to really center equity, especially in the legislative session. And, you know, it, it's just so fundamental that we recognize that there is inherent inequities and challenges within the legislative system. And we have to be very honest about those inequities that exist as we continue to um, participate in this process. How much time do I have, Robert? Uh, you got I uh, <laughs> Oh, I, I okay. <laughs> I saw you unmute, so I thought you were going to say that. But um, you know, it's just for I, I really wanted to leave in the hearts and minds because the session is about planting seeds in the same way this conversation should be about planting seeds. That if we are really committing ourselves to centering equity, that we must include those who are most impacted by any legislation at the center. And for us, it means that legislation needs to look, the process needs to look differently. It should not be imposed upon the people that it most impacts. And it's really time for us to ask ourselves, the hard question is who does this legislation harm? Who does it benefit? Who was at the table to decide even the drafting of this legislation? You know, who were the decision makers? And for me, as someone who focuses on equity work, is who was especially not in the room? And for us, you know, at the Law Center, it just, oh, thank you. It really means that we have to continue in our legislative process to uphold environmental justice. And again, that means we're centering the people who are most impacted, who are frontline. Um, people of color, low income, rural, tribal, indigenous communities, that we have to center their voices throughout the entire process. And that's what I'm really excited about at the Law Center. There's going to be a shift in our legislative work. And it's that we are going to be very intentional about including our clients and the communities who are most impacted throughout the entire process. And I will say, that in the environmental circle, although we unified against hydrogen, we also had some tensions because, you know, the young leaders of color across the state who are from frontline communities reminded the big environmental organizations that their communities and their voices rightfully belong at the center of discussions and that they must be at the table when legislation is being created for them. So I just want to applaud all those powerful young people who had the courage to really um, call out the big environmental orgs to change the way they do legislation. And that same way, 
I really invite our legislators and, you know, for us as the constituents, that we also change the way that we participate in legislation and that we always ask ourselves those questions. Who is benefiting? Who is being harmed? Who is not at the table? And that we make sure that we that those voices are present as we continue in this process. And so, um, you know, just closing the, you know, my thoughts, this is a very important and critical environmental moment. The last, you know, um, report from the IPCC was released. And again, it's that it's this, this is urgent, it's critical. We must work together to demand climate and environmental justice. And that's what we're dedicated to at the Law Center. And again, you know, let's this work and the intersection of environmental justice and legislation really demands us to do this work differently and to really center equity throughout this entire process. And so with that, please always feel free to reach out to me and thank you for inviting me to speak today. I appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, are there any questions for Virginia? I, I see in, in the chat, Virginia, somebody asked, uh, Elaine Hebert asked, can you say something about Santolina? Yes, hi, Elaine. Um, we had, for those of, and I know some of you are actually following Santolina. I'm a proud um, founder, co-founder of that, you know, the, the rowdy bunch that we've been fighting Santolina based on water issues for eight years. And for the first time in eight years, we had a win at the County Planning Commission. They voted not to approve amendments by the staff. And again, those critical questions were coming out at the forefront, but that was had never been seen. So we're hoping that things the same way they need to shift at the legislative body, that the same way they're shifting, um, hopefully at the county level. And we were trying to get um, legislation pass through that would fund a study to really look at the economic impacts of Santolina on our entire you know, city, county. And I believe that it was vetoed. And so there it went, no more study. And so we're back to our grassroots efforts in trying to raise funds to have a, a current economic analysis. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm not seeing any other questions in the, the chat. Anyone have any questions for, for Virginia? I, I just have Nothing. a comment. I, Bob, I just have a comment. Vir, uh, Virginia, thank you so much for um, lifting up that we need to center the voices that are most impacted in our legislation. I, I know that from working on uh, and giving public comment at the last how many like legislative sessions I supported. Uh, House Bill 65, which was done and written by uh, Romero and Rubio, Rubio uh, and then House Bill 111 the year previous in the 2021 session. And when we talked about like housing modernization and, and, and modernization and renters' rights, no renters were actually, no renters, no tenants were uh, asked to talk about like the rights we were trying to give them. And so how could we write legislation based on, you know, to give somebody rights when we haven't even asked them what rights that they want? And so, and that's that's the truth for a lot of legislation that has passed. Uh, across the country, across every state. And so I encourage every one of us on this call today to tell your legislators that it needs to center the those that are most impacted by the laws that we try to create every single time. Okay. okay. Well, if there's no other questions. Uh, thank you for coming to speak to us, Virginia. It's been, been very interesting and helpful. Yes. Um, I guess we're at the end of the meeting. Uh, anybody have any uh, announcements to make? Uh, but I, real quick, we're gonna have uh, Tim Keller and Eric Griego at our Unite Night on the 22nd. So I'd love to have you all there and uh, that's, uh, and it'll be via Zoom. So thank you so much, uh, Senator. Ortiz Pino and, and Virginia and, and uh, Representative Martinez, you all are amazing. Thank you so much for your work. Thank you. 
I, I just left a long link with the, I know people are interested in, in joining the uh, results for the pre-primary uh, election from last Saturday. I just left the link in there. You have to register just to get in. I believe, I believe that's still open. Um, and I know that starts at four. So folks are welcome to jump off if they want to go to that next meeting uh, or they're welcome to stay. I know that some folks may have had some other community announcements. So yes, it, it, you're welcome to either share that uh, in the chat or unmute yourself. We'd be glad to hear them. Thanks, Martine. Good to see you. <laughs> well, all right. Um, so, Bob, I believe, uh, is there is there anything else you want to add before we, is there someone else? I, can I ask a question? I have a... I have a, I have a question um, that I'm not sure how it how um, how it would be handled. I've just been watching and so disturbed by the the local legislation around like in 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 Texas around the anti-trans youth like that targets the youth and it's been targeting social workers to do mandated reporting and linking it to child abuse and and I'm fearful that as it comes to New Mexico is that something that we're on the lookout for. Absolutely. Um, I'm just looking to see if any one of our representatives are still on the call. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't feel like it was fair for them. It was more for like just our ward meeting because um, I didn't want to I didn't want to throw a wrench into whatever they were doing. It just I just learned about it in the past couple of days and it was just so horrific. Yeah. Um, you know, Emma, I know that there are some groups already working on that already. Um, and also just taking in the fact that like some people are fleeing Texas. Uh, I understand right now. And so um, happy to share any resources I have uh, with some folks adding like any sanctuary or anything like that um, within the organizing community, because I know it's, it's dangerous out there for some folks and for some family. But if there are other folks who know more than I, we have a large community of people that are active in community. Uh, you're welcome to unmute and share or um, point people in the right direction. I'm not sure what you're asking for, but I just point out that, that while places like Texas are, are doing incredible work to restrict voting rights, for instance, and, and ban abortions and, 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 the, and the trans bill that, that you're talking about, New Mexico has been doing the opposite of each of those things. We, you know, we just, it didn't pass, but we just had this massive effort at, a, at an expansion of voting rights, a bill that would have done the exact opposite. We just, in the last session, we passed a bill to make sure that even if Roe versus Wade gets overturned, that abortion rights will still be protected in New Mexico. So your concerns are real. They are very real nationally and, and what's going on in the world. But, I, but the specific bill that you're talking about coming to New Mexico strikes me as not what's going on right now, not the direction New Mexico is headed. Thank you. I appreciate that, that even that reassurance. It actually means a lot. Thanks. Any other comments, questions? Sharing. Hi, Emmett. I walked by your house the other day, by the way. I don't know if you were home or not. <laughs> Awesome. Well, uh, I think we will, Felice or Bob, is there anything you want to add before you're going? No, I think it was a great meeting. Thank you guys. I think, you know, people got a lot of questions answered. Um, I'm very proud to see that New Mexico will be a sanctuary state for lots of, you know, horrible things that are happening around the country. I think we're pretty safe about that. Um, so, <laughs> yeah. Cross our fingers. Yeah. And toes. Um, no, I think that's it for me. All right, y'all. Um, I, I, you know, our next meeting is, uh, this, what, when is our next meeting, Bob? April 10th. April 10th. So Sunday at three. 
<laughs> uh, yes, I'm like, what is going on? How are we doing this? Um, I also just will note, like, we'll probably have more answers on what or how the ward lines are being drawn up. Uh, I know Bob and, and Terry and I are talking about that right now. So just heads up for those still on the call, like we're talking about that now. And obviously, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to us about the process, about any of the lines that are coming up and like which ones are going where. Um, I know some folks are a little sad that, you know, some south of south of central is leaving 11C and going into 14. I, I will miss folks like Barbara um, going forward, but, you know. I know that's the the reality of redistricting. So we'll see you on April 10th. And Bob and Felice, if you want to stay on the line for a bit longer, like we can just debrief really quick. And um, we, but Elaine, good to see you. Um, and we will see you all very soon.